So we were having some trouble. This is on, yes? And the pointer. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's a real honor to be here. Um, when I first came, I had kind of a standard presentation where I was going to walk you through you know, my life and, and my work. Um, but I've been really humbled uh, and really almost kind of had the breath taken out of me um, listening to the other speakers and, and watching the other presentations. So I went out and I took a walk, tried to reflect on, uh, on everything, and I ran into this statue that's just out here. Uh, and if you haven't seen it yet, I'd recommend it. It's a beautiful silver uh, piece that just moves, and it's called Carpe Diem, so seize the day. Um, and what I decided I wanted to do with my presentation is really switch from talking about what I do uh, to why I do it. I'm really looking at if, if, if the purpose of this uh, event is to really convey to uh, prospective entrepreneurs who are just entering their careers that you can do it, which you can and you should, um, and I think that's been very clear in the conference. What I want to do is, is talk about uh, you know, finding exactly how, finding that reason, that motivation. And, and before I get into my own story, uh, I think it's important to talk about a huge influence in my life, and that was Viktor Frankl. Um, if you've read his book, Man's Search for Meaning, it was required reading for us in psychology in high school. Uh, he talks about, Viktor Frankl is a Holocaust survivor, he talks about witnessing the extreme circumstances in the death camps in World War II, and, and realizing that those who didn't have a reason or couldn't find a reason to persevere would not and they would give up, and they would stop doing everything they had to do, no matter how humiliating, no matter how inhuman, to survive. But those who did kept doing those things and found a way to push forward amidst, against all odds. So Viktor Frankl and that message have been a huge motivator in my life. And when I read that in high school, and I asked myself that question, what is that motivator? I didn't have an answer. Uh, and that was extremely challenging for me when I asked, what, why am I here? What's my reason for being? I just drew up a blank. Now that changed when my grandparents, who may be here, yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you. We have a lot of lights. That changed when, for the first time, I got to leave the United States. Uh, with my grandfather, Lyle, sitting in the back. Thank you. And uh, we went to Singapore and Indonesia and East Timor. Now, having never left the United States, it's, it's incredibly humbling to first see Singapore, which is a beautiful uh, and well-built city. But then we went to Indonesia, to a place called Yogyakarta, immediately following a significant earthquake that had done lots of damage and taken lots of lives. And when we arrived, there was destruction everywhere but people were rebuilding. And when we went to East Timor, uh, only for three days, it was during a time of civil unrest. So there was an active military presence. There were internally displaced people all over the capital. There was lots of destruction. And this was a shocking, jarring experience to me that just shook me to my core because I felt futile. I, I came with my value sets, my predispositions, my understanding of the world, and I had them completely thrown on their head and I saw the, my first glimpse of how so much else of humanity lives. And, and again, I asked that question, what's my reason for being? What's my contribution here? And again, I drew up a blank. The image that sticks with me most and, and has since given way to that motivation, to, to uh, Viktor Frankl referenced uh, a quote from Nietzsche, which was, he who knows the why to his existence can endure any how. So the why that I started finding was based on this image that you see. And this is an internally displaced persons camp that was immediately across the street from the hotel we were staying in called Hotel Timor. And from the all-you-can-eat breakfast room where we were sur surrounded by Portuguese riot breakers, Malaysian police, Singaporean regulars, Australian soldiers, all dining there in relative opulence, there was this refugee camp across the street. And looking from their view to mine was a really awkward and somewhat humiliating experience. Because for some reason, 
I got to sit in that environment, in their world, in their country, in their neighborhood. And when I kept asking why, the reason, the only reason I could find was because there was some little piece of plastic that had my name on it that said Visa, that said, for some reason, some institution trusts me with credit and will give me access to these rudimentary financial services so I can enter and exit these situations whenever I can apply myself to schools, I can be healthy, I can teach my children, I have all these opportunities when, when so many others don't. And in the figures, one in, one in three people on earth has absolutely no access to financial, uh, formal financial services. They pay an extremely high amount for extremely little. So this was, this was the trigger for me, that was realizing that that is a huge reason for a lot of, uh, a lot of these problems. And it's not just money. I mean, money is a conduit to many other things. It can let me, if, if I have a problem with my health or if there's a crop failure, obviously that's the primary problem. But the way to mitigate that is to have savings or to have access to some kind of insurance. So I launched myself kind of on this quest to keep learning and, and keep digging down into the roots of exactly that problem. How do we get formal financial services, fair financial services, to these one in three people on Earth, there's 36 percent of humanity that has no access. And the next summer, I went to northern Uganda. This was 2007. I spent three months working in the refugee camps in the north in a town called Gulu. And I met this girl in a camp called Chope, which in Acholi means, means no man's land. Uh, there were 20,000 people at that time in no man's <coughs> land. Uh, and unfortunately, I never got to learn her name, but every time we were there interviewing former combatants, she would come up to me and she would snot all over my leg. She was very adorable. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll call her Anina. And Anina, for some reason, always stuck with me and it's been a continual motivation. I always think back to first the image of that refugee camp, that stark juxtaposition of me being inside and everyone else being outside. And then I think that refugee camp was full of Aninas, just like in northern Uganda, in no man's land. The, uh, just this year, I, I spent several months in Sierra Leone. I think another speaker, Rocco, may, may be uh, doing work there as well. Yeah, it's a little nummy country, me buddy. <laughs> but uh, working there and, and further exploring this, this, this absence of access to services and, and questioning, you know, where do I contribute, is where I finally concretized my answer to that question, what is your reason? Why are you here? And what good will you do? What difference will you make? And the answer to that was that there are all these systems out there, these mobile money systems, that allow you to transfer money from person A to person B with a text message. It's incredibly safe, it's immediate, it's secure, and it saves you a ton of money. And when you make less than $2 a day, every cent on every transaction you can save is significant. Every, every, impact, uh, every cent you save is household income. That's saving for your child's education. That's buying food for the next week. And I, I started working on this uh, nonprofit called Frontline SMS Credit uh, that, that set out to build open source tools to really develop mechanisms to connect microfinance institutions serving women like this, small retailers, with mobile money services by building this integration point and helping that become more efficient, again, just to help deliver those financial services to the poor so that as a partner and not as, not as a client patron setup, so that they have the choice, they have the savings, and they have the dignity to choose what to do with it. Um, so I'll skip this. Because again, I wanna, what I wanna keep coming back to, and if there is one central message of this, uh, this conference, I think. It's, it's really about painting an image of the future for all of you and your positions in it and your ability to contribute to it. Um, I think it's essential that you find your muse, your reason. And, and in order to do that, you have to push your limits and you have to be uncomfortable and you have to be vulnerable. And one of the, the you know, I think, uh, we had the cupcake analogy before, you know, leadership is sexy, but it's also messy and full of all sorts of ingredients. I think it's important to understand and embrace as you enter 
you know, your own fields and as you chase your own dreams and find these reasons. Just to understand that uncertainty will be a huge part of your life and that will be unwaning and you have to own it. Uh, and you will get out of your comfort zone and you should because if you get out into the world and be a part of it and experience it and live with people and learn from people and let down your walls, then that commonality comes out and it creates this perpetual motivation you know, to serve your brother or your sister and, and to work together. So whenever I get hit with these huge struggles, <coughs> these daily struggles, really a roller coaster of, of, of leadership, of social entrepreneurship, whatever mantle we're putting on it, I think back to the Aninas of the world, or this is Muhammad, Freetown. I think back to that image of the refugee camp in East Timor, and that stark juxtaposition. And I, rem I remind myself that this is why I do what I do. And no matter what happens, no matter what's thrown at me, no matter how much dirt I get drugged through, and no matter how many times I fail, and I have, I'm going to keep failing, I'm going to do this because of Muhammad and Anina and every person in that refugee camp in East Timor that I will never help, that I think about every day, and every person in that refugee camp in Chopei who is just like me and once uh, has the same dreams and just needs the means to achieve them. Thank you.